For a number of years, democracy has been invoked very often by political NPCs to defend our attack a vision on this and that political subject. People who come out of the democratic framework are considered outcasts and would thus be discredited without demonstration. In fact, the elites use this word as they want and it starts with an NTS century with the American Democratic Party by using it as an element of political marketing communication but without a concrete proposal to get closer to democracy. Very often, the defense of democracy is accompanied by a discourse on fundamental rights and freedom and linked with the elections. Except that obviously all this is ridiculous since democracy never in history before the 19th century had any connection with this. We really have to understand that universal suffrage is really recent. So elections are not at all a characteristic of democracy. The elections is not synonymous with democracy. You can repeat it as much as we want to say that the countries with elections are democracies that will not make it true. Many people have already explained it, but it is still important to repeat it. A country where we elect leaders is not a democratic country, it is an oligarchic country with elective legitimacy. Democracy means power to the people in Greek, and the power is not with the people when we elect the people who will decide for us. A democracy is a state where the people as a whole decide the laws. It is a regime where the people themselves decide on their standards, void directly on laws and other legal standards. That's it. It is therefore opposed to oligarchy power to a few and to monarchy power to one person. So that raises a lot of questions, who is part of the people and how they decide on laws in particular. But what is certain is that a few hundred people in an assembly are not the people. In France we have 577 deputies out of almost 70 million inhabitants. And in Norway the state considered the most democratic by the economist group has 116 members of parliament for 5.4 million inhabitants, which makes one for 32,000 people, which is 0.003% of the population. So some talk about representative democracy, but once again a democracy is when the people as a whole decide on the laws. So if we want a representative democracy, in fact we should draw the leaders by lot to have a representative sample of the population. In fact, the expression representative oligarchy would be closer, but even this expression is rotten because today the leaders represent nobody. People vote for the wrong reasons, they vote for the reputation, communication, newness of the party, or even for the personal characteristics of the candidate. In any case, what is certain is that a good part of the voters do not know the programs or the assessment of the candidates, and in reality do not even understand the stakes of the elections, since they do not know the competencies of the assemblies and the impact of political decisions on their daily lives. Who is able to say the competencies of the governments of his country? Almost nobody. So imagine for the European Commission or the European Council or the local assemblies. Are the Germans able to say what are the competencies of the Bundes lenders compared to the federal government for example? Who is able to quote a proposal for the main candidates for the elections? Almost nobody. For example, can Italians cite a democratic party proposal in regional or European elections? I hardly doubt. And then who is able to quote a law passed in his country? Hardly anyone, so imagine an article of the European Union treaties, or a regulation of the European Union, or of a local assembly. And yet very important decisions for our daily lives are or could be made every day in these assemblies. This is why these assemblies are not representative of everyone. Even if the population were aware of the different programs or reports of the different candidates and of the competencies of the assemblies or the different institutions, that would still not be enough to vote in conscience since it would also be necessary to know the arguments in favor and against its position. This is what it would be like to vote consensuously, to vote knowing the arguments in favor and in disfavor of the different positions for each political question. And today we are clearly very far from it. And some will say that this is also why the oligarchic system is the only one that works, people being ignorant on political issues. There have to be professionals who deal with it. So in fact no, but that was not the question in fact. The question was whether are we in a representative regime, yes or not. So now that this question is answered, the interesting question is would a democratic regime would be possible or even de desirable? For me yes it is. As I say, the representative system would require citizens to be at a very high level of political knowledge of the issue of the different proposals and the different arguments, because in fact an uninformed vote has no value or even a negative value. But this principle applies all the more to a democratic regime where the people directly vote for the laws. This regime therefore has a very high level of requirement to function or even if simply to exist. This is why in reality a regime can only be democratized gradually. The population must be more and more politically informed and better and better progressively, so that the power is gradually given to the citizens. 
So there are actually two transitions, the institutional transition making the institution more and more democratic until all citizens vote for the laws, and the epistemic transition so that the people are more and more politically enlightened. One does not go without the other, and this rule of information should be that of the institution relating to knowledge, the media and the school. The laws on free and compulsory education have never served any other purpose than to train people to enter a world of work which has changed greatly and which has demanded higher levels of qualification. And the proof is that if the objectives of these laws was the emancipation of human beings, well, they would have also made food and housing free, among other things. To stop your shitty hypocrisy with equal opportunities or child labor, if you wanted to ban child labor, all you had to do was ban it and redistribute the wealth. Our oligarchs have never had the goal of training or educating the population as a whole about political issues, and they have conscientiously kept us in political ignorance to stay in power. Yeah, because it goes back to the first argument in favor of democracy, it is incorruptible. No one can abuse its power. Since the 7th century before Christ and the appearance of the great anti empires, a part of human beings has always aspired to dominate others, to control them, to direct them, even if it means reducing themselves to the worst baseness and immoral practices, first enslaving by arms in the kingdoms and other empires, and then lying, betraying, manipulating in the oligarchies when others will purely and simply abuse their power. The most striking example is that of the European Socialist Parties. The French Socialist Party is regularly denounced in France, which has pursued a right-wing policy since 1983 when it came to power, but it is the same principle for many of the major supposed far-left parties in Europe, such as the Socialist Party of Portugal or the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party in Spain, and which end up pursuing neoliberal policies in power. When initially the parties had the project of abolishing capitalism by establishing a socialist society, which proves that the lack of integrity of politicians clearly transcends borders. Broken promises concern political elites around the world. And that's not to mention all the cases of corruption and abuse of power, a democratic political system where power is extremely deconcentrated and where people directly vote for laws cannot be corrupt by definition. It must be reminded that the very principle of all states is supposed to be to defend the general interests. However, the states of the global north, so-called democratic, have deliberately chosen for two centuries to favor the interest of a handful of people over the vast majority by giving them the essential part of the value produced by the workers and by imposing on this last extremely violent living conditions. In short, the establishment of liberal capitalism. And this is explained by the simple fact that in reality it is the rich liberals who have gradually taken power for more than two centuries. These are therefore genuine political and financial oligarchies that have been formed in the developed countries since American independence. In fact, we have a large number of high officials, ministers and members of parliaments who come from the private sector. Because we talk a lot about lobbies, but in reality there is not even a real need to put pressure on political elite that has professional and even personal links with members of large financial groups. And you even have some who go back and forth. So the question we could legitimately ask is why do voters vote for them? It would be enough not to vote for them in elections, however they are systematically elected. In fact, it is due to the investment of rich liberals in the media. Once freedom of speech and of the press was granted in a state, wealthy liberals immediately took over the political press to propagate their ideas among the population and promote candidates favorable to their interests. And this strategy of the cultural battle has never ceased to be used thereafter by the financial powers with the investment of all the new media as they appeared in all the countries where the freedom of press and expression is guaranteed. If we take the example of France, we often talk about the 9 billionaires who currently own 90% of the media, but the main 5 newspapers in the end of the 19th century of, and the beginning of the 20th century are also created and owned by wealthy individuals. In the United States, for example, we currently have 8 large financial groups of the press, 5 for the radio and 9 groups for television. We also have Silvio Berlusconi who created a huge media empire in Italy and who ended up controlling 90% of Italian television, knowing that Berlusconi also went into politics afterward and was head of government for almost 10 years. Media owners and journalists often know politicians personally, they live in the same circles. More than half of the French press pass holders live in the Paris region, for example, and they or their children attend the same schools. We have the example of Macron who was elected thanks to his personal proximity to Xavier Niel and Bernard Arnault, who are themselves bosses of large industrial groups and media bosses and who largely contributed to his elections. It is therefore political financial media oligarchies that run the elective regimes in the developed world. 
Remember that for a party or a candidate to be led in an elective regime, it only leads to have a majority of the vote during the elections. That is to say 50% of the votes plus one. So yes, the media allows people to get elected when it's very close. In fact, I said that the freedom of the press and of expression is guaranteed, but these freedoms do not even exist either, since in reality very few people can speak in front of an audience today. You have to be invited on radio or television sets by influential people in the media, they are the ones who decide who speak and do who do not speak. In fact, freedom of expression does not care, it is equality, plurality of expression that is important. And even more, the important thing is not to express oneself, but to be informed. It is not the expression of one's opinion that counts, but the reception of the truth. Discovery of the truth is only possible if the plurality of expression is guaranteed, but therefore the plurality of expression serves to discover the truth. Today, the weak and mediocre plurality of expression only serves to rant one's opinion, just to put oneself forward, to show everyone his intellectual superiority over the others, and not to show nuance, listening, humility and skepticism, which are nevertheless fundamental elements in sorting the truth from the false. And then again, it's more the form that takes precedence on the substance. We focus on the person who speaks, we let ourselves be seduced by his or her way of speaking, and we forget to think or to seek if his arguments are valid or not. And then we polarize the debates, we communitarianize ideologically ourselves, the left against the right, the extremes against the progressives, the conservatives against the liberal, etc. We seek to be part of an ideological group rather than to show critical mind. Especially since the perverse effect of the elective system is that it exacerbates ideological communitarianism. So as a result, the elective system is nourished, since it promotes an ideological communitarianism, which itself will make you want to apply your ideas, and especially not to allow those of others to be applied, and therefore to obtain power at all costs, and therefore to participate in elections, whether as a candidate, an activist, or simply a voter, which will further legitimize the elective system. So what is needed is to have a space, an institution where rational and constructive opinions can be heard on political issues, so we can focus on the substance of the arguments in order to form an enlightened opinion. Another quality of democracy is the possibility of a long-term vision. Today elected officials have a term limit, and if they are not re-elected, politicians change, so long-term projects are impossible, which can be a huge problem for the politics of a country. And then the elected people are generally very attracted to positions of power, and therefore will do everything to get re-elected, even if it means making short-term decisions. Whereas in a democratic regime, we can quite imagine a form of durability for certain decisions, because people are not going to change their mind every minute without having seen the impact of their decision. We can also simply democratically limit in time the possibility of going back on a law on a decision. And it is very appropriate for what requires planning as for ecology. Another advantage of democracy is the fact of not being obliged to join a political party and to show unfailing loyalty to the party, to defend its members and the program in all circumstances, even if we don't agree. In other words, don't be influenced by the group. We would be much more independent from the rest of the individuals and we could vote law by law, article by article as we wish. And I think that is a very good thing for the general interests. A last advantage of democracy and not the least is the feeling of legitimacy of political decisions. Today we no longer want to submit to laws and other decisions because we hate to be subject to rules over which we have no control. We are perfectly capable of imposing ourselves rules and decisions that are sometimes even extremely restrictive if we have participated in their deliberation and their vote after having understood the reason for these rules. So uncorruptibility, objectivity, independence, long-term vision and legitimacy of decisions, these are qualities specific to democracy, but now the problem is that it is very difficult to put in place. As I said, this must be done gradually, step by step, and the first step is to start debating, exchanging arguments, trying to be as constructive as possible, not trying to convince each other, but rather trying to share your vision of things with others on different topics, to share what you know or rather what you think you know. The second stage is to consolidate this movement, to invite as many people as possible to participate, to involve people in this process, his friends, his family, the comrades of his entourage more or less close. And the third stage is to organize, to find strategies, to involve more and more people in this movement, to discuss ambitious projects, to communicate to the population our ideal of society and then make political proposals with the intention of applying them in society, in reality, to prove that it can work, that democracy is a system that allows us to make the right decisions. 
Today people are systematically dissatisfied. We are promised change with each new election and they are disappointed each time. What more do we need to change the system? It is not only possible, desirable, but in reality it is also necessary. Not only because the great challenges of our century will never be solved in our system, but also because that popular discontent can crystallize, materialize by the coming to power of political movements that we risk bitterly regretting. We need to make a positive exit from this crisis. We can do it.